sour. Join us, come and waste an hour or two. We've got magic to do just for you. Welcome to Studio 10 Talk. Welcome, welcome, and good evening. I am Patrick Cassidy. I am the artistic director for Studio 10. And tonight, you're joining us here at Studio 10 Talks. We are so excited for tonight's show. I got so much to talk about. I want to remind you guys all at the top that, remember, we survive on tickets, selling tickets and donations. And right now, we can't sell the tickets. So we just take donations. You'll see during the course of your show, we're going to run the screen there, there at the bottom. Please click on it. Please donate. The reason Studio 10 Talks is because of you guys donating. And the reason we get these incredible get guests like Drew Ogle, who you're going to meet in a minute, and Debbie Gibson, who you're going to meet in a few minutes, is because of that. So please, please uh, step up and do. Uh, what is new? What is new? Well, I went to Kentucky this weekend. I actually saw my, my son sing the first dance at his best friend's wedding. He got married and it was so emotional. I was there with my family and Kentucky is incredible. Wow. I was some bluegrass players that played at the wedding and um, it was gorgeous. We were on this Kentucky farm and, uh, and I even went to Floyd Collins grave, which is going to be ironic because we're having Mr. Adam Gettle on in two weeks who wrote the musical Floyd Collins. And I'll talk about that later, but let's get to the show tonight. Um, again, I want to welcome our first guest. He's the executive director of the Nashville Repertory Theater, co-founded Encore Theatrical Company in Morristown, Tennessee, served as its managing director until August of 2017, executive director of the Rose Center Council for the Arts, then served as the general manager of the Florida Repertory Theater for one year before being invited to return to his home here to join Nashville Rep. He holds a certificate in transformational nonprofit le leadership from the University of Notre Dame Mendoza School of Business. Please welcome Mr. Drew Ogle. We got magic to do. <laughs> okay, so my first question to you, were you ever an actor? Were you ever an actor? Oh, Patrick, I have to say, you know, I watch your show and week after week you get to interview these amazing creative people and it makes me so jealous. I did want to be an actor when I was younger, but as you know, when you're an actor, you have to go wherever the work is. <laughs> a and, gun for hire. We are and, guns for hire. And, you know, for me, stability was the number one game. And so, um, I, so I left acting and now I'm an administrator and I couldn't love it more. It's great. I'm so glad that you said that. It's funny, you know, because I asked Ernie, you know, you are, by the way, I'm so happy to have you on because of the artistic directors and the and the and the people that run the theater companies or the professional theater companies, you're the last one I've I've gotten to talk to. And and the rep, you were actually the last show. The last show I saw before COVID happened was the Streetcar, which was just Streetcar. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. But I've asked them all. I mean, Denise, who runs Shakespeare, is an actor, still mm -hmm. an actor, even though she mm -hmm. runs Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And Ernie is an actor and, mm -hmm. and and was an actor and stuff. So it was mm -hmm. going to be my first question to you, but you did do it at one point. It was something that you. I did, but you know, when you're an actor, you really have to know what your strength is. You know, are you a singer? Are you an actor? Are you a dancer? And I asked myself that question and the answer was, I'm an administrator. It, so that's the question <laughs> that I've been asking myself lately. <laughs> <laughs> Administrator, no. Artistic, yes. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, welcome, man. It's so good to see you. And Thank you know, you. one of the things that COVID has been good to me personally is it's it's gotten I've gotten a chance to know you. Thank to you. Know, you know, to know uh, Ernie and to know Denise because mm -hmm. we've gotten to meet and we've gotten to talk and gotten to sort of commiserate about what what we're going to do, what do yeah. we do? Yeah. And now Kenny, Kenny part of our, that's uh, exactly right. And Kenny, yeah. yeah, Kenny was the last meeting we had. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, tell me about where you're at these days and where the rep is at and where, and, and how, and how you guys are faring. Oh, I tell you, you know, when we had shut down in March, we were two weeks away from opening the biggest show that we had produced in over a decade. Uh, we were going to do Disney's Mary Poppins and um, in fact, the rep was about to close out its highest attended season in over a decade. Mm -hmm. And of course, now everything is different and we have to rethink how we can serve our audiences and how we can serve our artists. 
And and in that time, I mean, I know that you've been, you've been doing a lot, like as as have we. Tell me about tell me what you guys have done in terms of like with the Black Lives Matter, in terms of diversity, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think that we have a responsibility as arts administrators. I think that we have a responsibility to be doing four different things right now. And you, you, you know, you mentioned one of them. Nashville Rep is using this time um, of, of this pause in our production as a time to reflect and redesign the rep mm -hmm. and asking ourselves, are we really the equitable organization that we, you know, say that we want to be? And I think the theater industry as a whole, you know, at times has not been the ally to our artists of color that, mm -hmm. we, that we claim to be. And I think that's been true of Nashville Rep, you know, specifically in our past. And so if we truly believe what we say we do, if we truly believe Black Lives Matter, if we truly believe representation matters, then, you know, we have to walk the walk as much as we talk the talk. And so we've been using that time to look at everything from um, the way that we, uh, you know, staff the organization, who our leadership is. Um, the staff has been going through a wonderful uh, 30 lesson uh, a program uh, to examine these issues. And it's, you know, I think you'll see a different national rep when we come out the other side. Oh, that's great. No, no. You know, one of the things I, I was so proud of when I arrived here was the first show that I got to see and sort of oversee as a producer was Cinderella, mm -hmm. which was such a diverse cast, starting with our Cinderella. Yeah. You know, and 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 I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so proud of that. And that's what we're doing, too. Oh, there's my wife. She says, hi, everyone. Hi, Hello, <laughs> talk. Hello, Mary Beth Richards. Excited to be here. Yes, we're excited to have you. We're, like, we're going to have a lot of questions during this time, Drew. But what I was saying is, is that it is like you guys. It's one of the things we're do, we're doing, too. We're going inside the company. We're, mm -hmm. We want we want people on our, our, our board of color. We want people, you know, we, we are trying to create not just in the staff, but but the whole, you know, the whole company as as diverse as possible. And and we're, we're making a difference. We're well, making we truly want to be, you know, we call ourselves Nashville Repertory Theater. And so we truly want to be the organization that reflects all of Nashville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell me about um, tell me about like what you see will be when we can produce what will be the new normal. Not that any of us has a crystal ball. <laughs> but what do you think the new normal could be? Yeah, that's the other thing we've been doing as administrators is we have planned and then we have replanned and then we have replanned again. The target, know. the target that moves. It moves, it moves, it moves. Well, first and foremost, I think we have to keep creating art, right? Mm -hmm. You know, even during the shutdown, it is what our audiences want, it's what our artists need, it's what our patrons expect. And, you know, just because we can't do it in person, that doesn't absolve us of the responsibility to keep doing what we were created to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, And I think, secondly, um, we have to keep people working as much as possible. You know, of course, we're not in full production right now, so we don't have uh, you know as many people on payroll as we typically would this time of year. But we've been able to keep most of our staff working and we've been able to create opportunities for artists. Uh, we've commissioned some playwrights and we have um, you know brought artists in for projects whenever we can. And for me, keeping the company financially healthy is part of, you know, part of that is keeping our artists as financially healthy as we can mm -hmm. during yeah. this, even if it's in small ways. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear and you. I think all of these things that we're putting in place right now, um, whether it's becoming resources for our artists or whether it's developing our digital content or what have you, those are all still going to survive when we come out of this and we return to full production. 100%, I couldn't agree more. In fact, we know that this little talk show that came out of this time, Studio 10 Talks, will be a part of our ongoing season of our ongoing, you know, I'll be continually calling my friends and, and I'm having their friends then call their friends. And, uh -huh. <laughs> and that's one of actually the, the sort of, you know, the nice things that, have, that has come out of this, which is that I always say out of the ashes, flowers start to bloom. And, mm -hmm. you know, having the relationship, like I said, with you and the other artistic people in, in, in here in Middle Tennessee, mm -hmm. and then putting together this show, which has kept, mm -hmm. you know, our name out there. And then that and that launch, we did our gala, which was virtual. And we've learned so much about the virtual world that mm -hmm. we're all living in right now. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. 
Well, you know, when we come out of this, uh, our community will need so much healing. And so you think about the role that artists can play in that. You know, we have our work cut out for us for years to come. It's so true. Oh, wow. That's great. I, you're, you're absolutely right. That makes more sense to me than anything. Um, tell me about, because I've never met her, and, and does she come to board meetings, Martha Ingram? Martha Ingram is truly the most um, oh, generous soul that I have ever met. And, you know, she was instrumental in creating the Tennessee Performing Arts Center. She was instrumental in creating Nashville Repertory Theater and Nashville Opera and Nashville Ballet. Mm -hmm. And the story goes that when she, she created TPAC first, and um, the story goes that at the opening of TPAC, there was an arts critic there. And she said, aren't you very proud of, you know, what we've done here? And aren't you going to write about it? And he said, well, no, Martha, you know, what you've created is a presenting house. And, you know, so where's the art? What? And so he, he walked away from that. She turned to her friends and said, well, ladies, it's time to go back to work. And, and that's how we were born. That was 30. Oh my gosh. Uh, we are in our 36th season and um, Nashville would be a completely different community without the work that she has done. I've heard that a true champion of the arts. I've heard that from so many people. Well, and, and does she come, does she come to board meetings? Is oh, she, absolutely. Oh, yeah. she's there. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and, and zoom. She's right on her iPad with us. <laughs> oh man! I, well, I look forward to the moment when I get to meet her because I've heard I've heard just what you said and more. There's Lori uh, Lori Gann Smith, Drew. She said, <laughs> "Lori is one of our tremendous artists. She is our resident uh, costume designer at the Rep, and she has been so busy during this time. She has been sewing masks for our healthcare workers. She has been uh, working on uh, video resources for artists." or for uh, teachers who are teaching arts online in the schools now. Oh, and, that's great. You know, I'm so proud of my team. Oh, that's great. Well, Drew, you've done a great job there. And like I said, mm -hmm. I, it was the last piece of theater wasn't even ours. It was yours that I got to see before uh, COVID happened. So I look, to, I look forward to seeing so many more shows. And I look forward to us and you guys and us collaborating. I've said this to, to Ernie over at the Children's Theater. I've said it to Denise at the Shakespeare Festival. And I'd love to I think that what we have is we have a lot of uh, really creative minds and a lot of really creative people and a lot of people that want to make things better. Yeah. You know? And what a tremendous opportunity that would be. Oh, it sure would. You're yeah. awesome, man. It's great. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. And Thank talking you about so much. I'm going to sit back and relax and I'm going to enjoy you and Debbie Gibson. Oh, you're going to have a good time. We're going to have a really good time. All right, Drew. I'll see you soon, pal. Right, thanks. So good to have him here. So great to hear. Okay, here we go. This guest, I'm so looking forward to this show for a myriad of reasons. Okay, Debbie Gibson. At 16, she became the youngest artist in history to write, produce, and perform a number one hit, Foolish Beat. Hmm, gosh, that's just one thing. Sold more than 16 million albums and has starred in 17 musicals in 17 years from Broadway to the West End, Eponine and Les Mis, Fanny Bryce and Funny Girl, Rizzo and Grease, the narrator and Joseph. I know a little bit about that part. Gibson created, executive produced, and starred in Hallmark Channel's Summer of Dreams. Launched her uh, serious XM radio show, Debbie Gibson's Mixtape, on the blend wall, the Mixtape Arena tour with uh, the new kids on the block was going on. Served as a celebrity job, judge on Nickelodeon's America's Most Musical Family. 2020 single Girls' Night Out soared to number four on the U.S. Billboard. And later this year, she will appear in an upcoming episode of Lucifer on Netflix. And her debut album, Out of the Blue, was, reiss was reissued on Blue Vinyl in September. Please welcome a friend, a good friend, Miss Debbie Gibson. Hey! Oh my gosh! Yes. You're so beautiful and blonde and all that stuff. Oh, hey, thank you. I've really gone west coast. You know, like when I was when I was in my twenties and thirties, I was like a pasty New York theater girl. I was like, I see the sun. We I lived in the theater. Yeah. Now west, I'm in Vegas. I've gone blonde. So you look fantastic. So tell me. So tell us all. You are living in Vegas. How long have you been there? I am, and I want to say you've gone blonde also. Yeah, well, no. Uh, by the way, just so you know, I, 
I was this color when we did the show together. I just was having to die all the time, all the time. I've been that color since I'm like, I don't know, my my mom started going gray at like 18. It's the yeah. Italian thing. I don't know. Um, but yes. How long, how long have you been in Vegas? About a decade. Wow, 10 years. Yeah. And, yeah. We're, and yeah. we're in Vegas without giving the address where exactly, do you live in Henderson? Do you live in, I know. No, no, no the Summerlin area. Oh yeah, beautiful. But everything I have to go to is in Henderson, which is like, it's like, oh, it's the other end of the world. But honestly, having lived in New York and LA, there's no traffic here. No. Like, no. I'm do totally you, spoiled. Totally you, spoiled. And, and why do I know the answer to this without asking? You're not a gambler, are you? No, I'm not a gambler. I didn't you know, know. I'm a gambler. You get to know when to hold on. <laughs> I love the song. But no, I don't frequent the casinos. No. Okay, so here's – now, I want to get clearance on this because I – even I get confused. I know – now, okay, this is the the first question is, do you go by <laughs> Debbie? Do you go by Deb? Do you go by Deborah? Or do you go by none of the above? <laughs> it depends who you are in my life. So like, okay, I wanted to be called, I actually loved my full name, D-E-B-O-R-A-H. My parents gave it to me. I loved it. Couldn't get anybody to call me by that name during my childhood. Teachers would say, you know, what's your name? I'd say Deborah. They turn around two seconds later and call me and say Debbie. And I'd be like, it's Deborah. I spent my whole childhood trying to get people to call me Deborah. So when I signed my record deal at 16, the label was like, yeah, Deborah Gibson, not so catchy for a little girl. I'm like, oh. So they tried to do like Debbie G or just Deborah or just, but like, everything felt too gimmicky. So by the time they circled back around to Debbie Gibson, I was like, I'll take it. Uh, but people that know me really well call me Deborah or Deb. But I've re-embraced it. I went then I went into Deborah for my kind of more theater phase. Uh -huh. Not for the reason because people were like, "Oh, you want to be taken seriously and you're grown up." I was like, "No, it's just the name I feel most connected to." And the Broadway dream was something I felt so connected to. So that little girl, Deborah, was getting I, I, I get it. I get it. Okay. And I wanted to see my actual name on a marquee. Then I was like, people are too confused. I've built up this brand. I've torn it down. I'm going back to Debbie, and I've re-embraced it. <laughs> I've embraced it in a new way. Now it feels like kind of who I am now. The blonde. Uh, and Andrea Kent says she's so excited to hear some Joseph stories. And oh, Andrea, yeah, we yeah, will yeah. tell you them in a moment. Uh -huh. Woo-hoo! Shout out to Deb. Shout out to Deb. Shout out to Deb. Shout out to Todd's such an incredible, incredible supporter of mine. I'm like, oh, let's see. I'm 46, been a fan since I was 16. Love you, Debs. Are you British, Glenn? Because because the Brits say Debs. Debs. So, okay, so let's. I want to go back to this because we have so, we, you and I have so much in common. Not just having worked together on the road for a year, but so you become a star when you're how old? 15, 16, 14, 16, 16, 16, 16 years old. Okay. And and you and was your first single that you were, uh, released Electric Youth? Was that number one? No, no, only in my dreams was first. That was first, okay. I went Shake Your Love, Out of the Blue, Foolish Beat, Lost in Your Eyes, then Electric Youth. Electric Youth was the title track of the second album. Okay, so for one minute, we're going to show our viewers and me because I can't wait to see a little bit of Debbie Gibson at the age of sixteen with Electric Youth. I, know, I, was like, I love it. Oh my God! Those guys you saw dancing in the front, Buddy Casamano, still dances with me to this day. Choreographs for me. We went to high school together. You're kidding! I kid you not. And Eddie Bennett, shout out. See, I love my. Oh, Melissa said all her dances. Oh, dances are your piece. <laughs> Step Stewart. There's nothing more fun than turning and looking on stage and seeing your friends. Oh, and then I agree. Or, and for me, it was turning on stage and seeing my wife. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, like all the Osmonds had their wives on the road. I was like the only one who didn't know anybody going in. <laughs> so, I just want to say, we have like a, like, oh, uh, like 100 people or something watching right now. Please uh, uh, tell your friends, share it, post it. Let us let, the, let them know. We have so many. Write in your questions because uh, we're going to answer as many questions as we can. All right. So... As you know, I can't. I come from this family of. I have two brothers that were pop stars, right. huge, gigantic pop stars. A little bit older than you, but not much. Like Sean, I. Think, but my sisters, my older sisters, had them had them on their walls. 
Oh, they did? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I had them in my house. <laughs> but, 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 but yeah, and David was like 18, 17 when he did the pilot of Partridge Family. And Sean, same thing, 17, 18, right out of high school. So, and I saw, I was fortunate enough as, the, as their brother to see, you know, the good part of it, but also the not so good part of it, of that kind of fame that mm -hmm. early in life and what it did to them. Okay. And I, and I learned so much of it. It helped me when I went into my, my, into my career. Now for you as a woman, as a young girl, tell me the good and the bad of becoming a star at that age. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think little girls, it was the case for me. I wanted to be a little girl. Like I enjoyed being a little girl. I didn't, I wasn't the little girl who was in a hurry to grow up and put on high heels. I was putting that off as long as possible. In the music business, that's hard to do. You've got the pressure from the male execs. And there was no me, me Too going on with me, but maybe verbally, if there was a Me Too movement back then, maybe. Like I don't, you know, um, but you did have the older male execs saying, you know, put on some heels, put on a little black dress. You know, but, So there was this like feeling of people were trying to force you to grow up. Now mm -hmm. I was very grown up in terms of my craft. I knew how to go into a studio. I knew how to tell the musicians what I wanted to play a B flat minor seventh, not a B flat, whatever it was. I could run a show, but then I wanted to play Pictionary on my bus with my dancers and my sister, <laughs> you know? So there was this dichotomy. Um, and as a little girl, like, you know, I think it made my mom, I know we're going to talk about my mom, we must talk about my mom in this interview. <laughs> and my mom, you know, moms want to protect their little girls anyway, and dads, but my mom was mainly the one by my side. She was managing and, me. And, and she was the manager. That, as well as your mother, she was your manager. Yes, yes but actually by default. So she didn't set out to be my manager. I had a, a male attorney, older male attorney managing me. And it was a little bit like, just not so we just didn't like the dynamic i'll just mm -hmm. put it that way <laughs> and and my mom really became my manager by default to protect me on the road because you sure. don't send your 16 17 year old girl out with whomever <laughs> you know no, no, right. I mom, but i can't imagine that dilemma I mean, it's a you know happy problem but it's like so yeah and, and also you know people were because i was younger constantly trying to like for instance foolish beat that song you talked about that that i have the billboard award on, on my wall <laughs> and i the guinness book of world's records because my mom pounded her fists on the table in a conference room full of male execs and said my daughter needs to produce this record because I know she knows how she wants it to sound and I know that's what's going to be best for the song and this was the first one no this was the first uh, record? Was the first ballad it was on the first album it was wow. the fourth Single. Wow. So, you know, um, I thank God she was right. I, I wasn't going to be like making these demos in my garage and then having hits without my mom. It wasn't going to happen. You know, okay. So, okay. So as, as promised, I, I, I told our viewers, you, you would sing a little bit. So I'd like to see now the adult version of electric youth. You might you give us a little taste of that. Sure. Hey, JT, my assistant's here. We're going to, we're going to move my rig or let's see. Can you see me back here? Can you I hear can me you. back here? Oh yes. You look pretty. Yes, you do. Oh, I will, I know you like your high boots. Melissa. Your boots I'm right. Right. Look at your boots. That's for you, Patrick. Let's see. Can you hear this? Yeah. Is that like Liberace's piano? <laughs> yes, that was Liberace's piano. 
I oh, you're kidding. It really, it really was? Oh, yeah, no, it really was. Oh, my gosh. It was, it was. In fact, here's, here's the stats on the piano. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. Look at that. But well, yeah. you'd think he would have a mirrored piano. <laughs> yeah, it was created for him in 1973. It was in his L.A. penthouse. Oh yeah, and uh, yeah, there's his um, caricature etch, etched in the glass. There's one right here. I'll give you a tour. Oh, yeah, three oh, of you. It's like, where's Waldo? It's where's, it's where's Lee? <laughs> when did you get the piano? When did, how long have you got? It was my first concert. I was like so enamored with his showmanship and his playing. Mm -hmm. And um, the piano, um, uh, Myron Martin, who actually runs the Smith Center out here in Vegas, mm -hmm. uh, he was my artist representative at Baldwin Pianos and he was Liberace's. And so he got it, uh, it, I guess, at like the estate auction or whatever. And I used to go visit his apartment on the Upper West Side just to play it. And I was like, if you ever want to part with this, you know, he goes, I was thinking about the Smithsonian. I go, think about the Gibsonian. <laughs> so, so he told to me, uh, but it's fine. I got it when I was 21 years old. Wait, my producer is saying so, yes? So I need you to tell everyone, just make an announcement. That people need to go to studio10talks.com uh -huh. to watch the show. So I, I've been told that people need to go to Studio 10 Talks to watch the show. Go to studio ten talks.com and you can tune in right now and you can hear Debbie and myself sing together. So yeah, yes. let's talk about how you and I met. Okay. Yes. Uh, we we did in in 1999, 2000, we did a production for there we are. <laughs> wait a sec. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, you got the color. You got the <laughs> And the black and white. I literally just remembered it was upstairs. I remembered where it was. I went, oh my God, let me run up again. <laughs> so we did a production for Troika. For, it was a year tour of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat. And you were the narrator, and I got to wear that color coat of many colors. Now, uh, it was an incredible tour. I had never been. It was my first tour. I ended up doing two more tours, including another one of Joseph. But it was my first time on the road for a year. And as you know, uh, my wife, Melissa, was in the show. She played Mrs. Potiphar, and she was one of the dancers in the show. And then, of course, our children who, you know, I mean, the reason I'm in Tennessee is because like, Jack is a, you know, he's a pop, he's a, he's a recording artist. And I, know, I know, I know. But they were, they were three and Jack was a baby, he learned to crawl and walk on that tour. I remember. Which was just incredible when I think about it. So, uh, so we go on the road for a year and, and I get to, do we have some pictures there, Mr. Mr. Guys? Oh, he's trying to find our pictures. We have some pictures and posters and stuff like that. But, okay. um, Tell me what you, how, oh, there's our poster. There uh, you see that? And, and if you look below, those are the Osmond brothers, the younger generation. So that's all of Alan Osmond's kids, or, or five. Uh, right, right, yeah. 11 kids, I think he has. He has eight, yeah. And they played my brothers, which was kind of ironic, a Cassidy playing jo Joseph with a bunch of Osmond brothers, which uh -huh. is hysterical. Um, tell me what the tour was like for you. So, I mean, the tour was great. We started at Paper Mill Playhouse, which was amazing. Um, I remember, like, before I get into, like, the people and, and the vibe on the road and all of that, I want to say anyone out there who's ever played the narrator knows this. You're, like, singing at the top of your, you're like, Jacob, Jacob, it's like, I want to get out of my neighborhood. Like, crazy notes that I don't roll out of bed hitting. Uh, and people come up after and they're like, that was such a cute show. And I'm like, I was just snapping. <laughs> you know, now it's so freaking hard to sing. But it was super fun. I know where you're going with this story. Oh, no, it's a, it was a oh. long tour. <laughs> no, 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 I know. Well, no, the tour was amazing. I mean, I met amazing, amazing people. I remember Lauren Wagner and yeah. Izzy and Mark Evans. Oh, my God, there's somebody I could, like, name the whole cast. And the Osmonds, I still talk to all of those Osmonds. And Doug, who was not on the poster, but he was a stage manager. Um, Great but, guy. And you know, and you do know how, how do you know how I came at this? Cause, the, cause their other brother, David, he had been playing Joseph. Right. David, uh, you know, they're Mormon and he went on his mission, his two year yeah, mission. Same, and, a, yeah. and a Cassidy stepped into the part, which was to I this day, know, it cracks I me know. up. But, you know, there was, a, cause again, I know, I know kind of where this is heading, but or I think I do, but you know, it was always interesting, like doing the, 
when what you, when you were a pop star at some point, and then you go to do theater. Like I love doing theater partially because I loved being one of the gang. I loved the idea that the whole show was not riding on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. If I got sick, I had a very fabulous, beyond capable understudy that was gonna go on. And I was like, oh, I wanted to be sick, but that was like a nice, relaxing thing. Like sure. the show goes on. It's not just like Debbie Gibson on a marquee. So, you know, I know that like, whenever I went to do theater, there was like a crossover period where, again, it comes back to my mom, where she'd be like sending me on the road, but kind of like, am I sending you out like you're this pop star? And I mean, like I was getting like death threats as a teen and everything. So this is all in the back of her mind. So she's again, like, I need to protect her. I need to protect mm -hmm. the brand, your image. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that it was always an interesting thing when I went on the road, it was like an identity crisis. Right. <laughs> Between now, Joseph, now, Joseph, though, you'd, you'd already done Eponine and Les Mis by then, you'd, and you, you had done Belle and Beauty and the Beast? Uh, I had done Belle and Beauty and the Beast. I did Reese in the West End playing Sandy and then Rizzo on the road in the US. And this was all prior to Joseph? All prior to Joseph, Okay. Yeah. okay well, we have one clip I wanna show from, are, are we ready? Do we have this clip from Beauty and the Beast of her? Okay. We have Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Uh, so much fun. I always loved doing that show because to little kids who didn't know the Debbie Gibson pop stuff, it was like, mommy, there's Belle. You'd hear that. The curtain would go up and you'd hear like, mommy, there's Belle, there's Belle, there's Belle. So that was a dream come true to play. And I got to play Cinderella also with Eartha Kid as my oh fairy my godmother, gosh. which was Unreal. I've got to live out a lot of dreams, so, Patrick. So, and, and, and you did, uh, but the first one, the first one was Eponine, right? First one was Les Mis? Yeah. That was kind of, so that was your move from sort of teen pop star to I'm going to go into the legit musical theater. Yes. And I loved it because Eponine is like a very pop kind of role, you mm -hmm. know, for theater. It's a little gritty and very belty. And, and because Les Mis is all sung, um, I didn't have to wrap my head around being this, you know, theatrical actress delivering dialogue. It was like, it was a great transitional show. Absolutely. You know, the irony is that my brother David had done Joseph on Broadway and, and Les Mis was at the Imperial Theater and Joseph was at the Royale, which was across the street. And David used to tell me, he said, you know, I love this Joseph job. I said, why? He says, because when I'm getting ready to leave the theater, Les Mis is just coming out for their yeah, intermission. Yeah, their intermission, I know. It's like a three hour and 15 minute, like it was quite a baptism into the Broadway world. Okay, so let's get back to the Joseph thing for a minute. So we, we're doing this tour and I'm, like I said, I'm raising with my wife, two children on the road. And and uh, and I agree, it was a great cast of people. And, and, and you and I had a moment where, <laughs> And I'm going to take responsibility for this moment because I, to this day, I'm not quite sure, but there was a moment when we didn't talk for like uh, four months. I don't know. I know. It was a good chunk of the tour. Thank it you. It was me. And it was me. And and the funny thing is about it is that I said, I said this to you. I said, you know, you can, there's funny thing about being the leading lady in Joseph and being the leading man is that you can be on stage for two hours or whatever it is and never I'll look never at each other. cross paths and not have to look at each other. It's the only two roles because the narrator is sort of talking to the audience and, and commenting on, in a presentational way, whereas Joseph right. is in the story most of the right. time. You right, know? Right, right. So it was easier than most to not have connection with you. What to this moment, and I and I because I adore you and we've become really good friends. And I and I want to say, I'll say on our show, I want to say I'm really sorry that I ever I did that because I was obviously upset to this day. I'm not quite sure what it was. Um, it maybe it was I felt that maybe you were upstaging me or I was upstaging you, <laughs> but there was something that just it just goes out the window when I see you now. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I know like we've, you know, talked about this. And again, I think it's what I was saying before about like, there was this little bit of like the, the like leftover vibe from the pop star moment. And it was like crossing into the theater with like the way maybe my mom handled contracts and <laughs> billing. And I, at this point, like, it's funny because, you know, agents and managers care about billing. They want like with special appearance buyer. They want their name in a box and whose right. name is bigger. 
you and I don't care about that. Yeah. It's like, we just want to do the work and do the shows and make people happy and have a good time. And so, but that stuff back then in my world, I guess, was like very important. Not to me, but to-, to the people my- that cared about you, the people yeah. that represent you. And in this case, yeah. That person happened to be your mother. So I know, and I loved when your mother came to visit. And I said, like, I don't know why he's not talking to me. She goes, I know, I told him he's acting ridiculous. <laughs> I was like, well, that, I well, that, that's when we got through it. I think it, I think it was in Raleigh, North Carolina. My mom oh my gosh, came, yes, and she that's where she visited. Yeah. And I kind my of mom, my yeah. mom came to see the show and she did. She said, You're acting like a baby. <laughs> she wasn't talking to you. She was talking to me. And I'm like, I hate confrontation more than anything in the whole world. I have very few enemies. And I'm just like, if you don't like me, you don't like me. But we don't have to have a confrontation about it. But I like marched into your room and I was like, I get along with everybody. What's happening? What is wrong? Just talk to me. Anyway, from that day on, it was done. And here we are now. You're you're awesome, Deb. You're yeah. awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad yeah, that okay. happened. But, but, it, but it leads me to this. Why is somebody that's so awesome and looks the way you look and as talented as you are and as smart as you are, why have you never been married, Deb? Because I'm smart. No, okay. no I'm kidding. <laughs> well, there's not many married people out there. I'm not talking about you. Uh, I was in a 10-year relationship that was like a marriage. Mm-hmm. And I never felt the need for the piece of paper. Now, either because I subconsciously knew it was going to have a beginning, middle, and end, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or because I've really like, you know, I grew up with a picture of my life. It included marriage. It include, included natural born kids, adopted kids. It, it had all these things, it had all these things in this picture. And then as I really took the steps in what my real life was and is, I was like, wow, that's just not feeling organic to me in this moment and this moment and this moment. And so, you know, I'm living my, like right this minute, like I've been happily solo now for two and a half years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as you know, I've been through a lot of health things that are kind of like ongoing. There's a roller coaster. For the first time in a very long time, I minus my mom as my business partner. I minus a boyfriend. Uh, I have an incredible manager, Heather Moore. We, we have like, just, we're always in a, we're just in a flow. My life is so uncomplicated Mm -hmm. and I want to keep it that way for a minute as I get stronger and healthier and do my music the way I want to do it without very strong opinions around Mm -hmm. me that, um, are more about that person than me, which like I've tended to attract that in my life where I attract strong personalities that feel like I need them to kind of be in control of me and my life. And I'm actually like, no, no I'm, I'm, owning, not I'm owning who I am now. And, and it's like a rebirth for me and I'm, I'm loving it. So I just really, I'm a fan of authenticity and things happen organically. And if, if that's meant to happen in this next chapter, you better believe it'll be the love of the, first of all, it'll get easier to stay married for the rest of my life because the rest of my life just got a lot shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we oh, here's Eric Hanke. He says, is Debbie going to do another closet cleaning for charity? I have one of her dresses hanging up in my closet. Eric, funny you should mention that. <laughs> JT, my assistant, has come back, and one of the top things on my to-do list, because I have all the clothes sitting out, yes, I, I am going to do that soon. So make some room in that closet. <laughs> so- Okay, so Deb, we play a game on this show. Okay. The name of this game is called Remember the Lyric. There it is. And Remember the Lyric essentially is, I'm going to sing a lyric Mm -hmm. from a show that you did, from a song that you sang. And then I'm going to point at you, and you're going to come back at me with if you remember the lyric. If you don't, you can make up a lyric. I'll throw another lyric at you, and that's how it goes, okay? Okay. So I'll start. I'm gonna, this, and this is going to be fun. This one is going to be fun. I, I thought long and hard. So nervous. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, I think so. 
I look handsome, I look smart. I am a walking work of art. Such a dazzling coat of many colors. How I love my coat of many colors. It was red and yellow and green and brown. And oh my God, you, I hate you right now. I'm gonna say it like all that. Wait, 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 I'm gonna help you, I'm gonna help you. It was red <laughs> and yellow and green and brown and scarlet and <laughs> black and ochre and peach. No idea. Ruby and olive and violet and, and bond. Bond? Bond? bond. Bond? I mean, okay. Oh my God. Lilac and gold and chocolate and mauve. I'm not even trying. Cream and crimson and silver and rose. Azure and lemon and russet and gray. Purple and white and pink and orange and I'm reading them. <laughs> I know you are. I can't even. First of all, I remember the horror of learning that. And usually I remember things like that. Like I could I could recite you the Long Island Railroad stops right now. Lindenhurst and Babylon. But I don't remember those colors. <laughs> wait, wait, Dev. Oh, I and, I and fuchsia and gold and pink. And I have no idea. It's good. No, no. I just want you to know I was just reading them, so I didn't remember them either. I, I saw you reading them. Oh my god. You have a question. It says, Hi Studio Tech. Question for Debbie. Loved her slave ride from 92 if she could sing a christmas song from 2020 what would it be oh my oh, 2020 i'm sorry for 2020 like a new uh oh my gosh hold on oh that's easy hold on why don't i bring you over to the piano a second yes Jamie, you have my light <laughs> no, <you do. laughs> for a minute hold on hold on i'm getting that would be because of what's going on in the world. I would say it's I'll be home for Christmas. You can count on me. I don't know the chord, so I don't know why I moved over to the piano. Please have snow and mistletoe and presents on the tree. That's what it would be. Oh my gosh, that's perfect. Okay, stay there. Wait, I've got you there. Now stay there. So. Now I'm gonna give you a song that you do know. So let's you and I attempt, yes. just attempt That's to good. sing a little bit for our, our, our fans watching, a little bit of any dream will do. Do you think we could do that? Absolutely. Now there's a lag, so I'll try to just, so we'll have to watch each other's mouths if we can see if we can harmonize a little okay. bit. Okay. Okay? What's the key? I can't hear the key. I close my eyes. I close it, is that high? Okay. I guess so. If you want to I close my that's a little high. We gotta go a little lower. Okay, so how about I close my eyes? Dream back the curtain. Just see for certain what I do. Classical stuff, and then I would just want to sit and like improv and play things I heard on the radio, and 
Uh, my, my piano, my longtime piano teacher, Morton Estrin, passed a few years back and his wife just got in touch with me. And I just had this great conversation with her about that. I'm like, I know Morton wanted me to be a concert pianist. And I was like, no way, I gotta sing. I gotta, <laughs> yeah, I gotta rock everything up. So, so I'm gonna, this is a cool question, I think. So being Debbie Gibson, in other words, becoming famous young and being, you know, it, it, it's a weird thing when you become famous and you get, you know, you get all these um, these privileges that, as you know, most people don't get a chance to to mm -hmm. live or to live out, right? Yeah. And and I used to talk about this with David. I've talked about it with Sean. I've talked about it with my parents. And and I think about the things that I got to do as a result of having some fame in this business. And mm -hmm. I and I, I'm going to tell you David's because David's to me was better than anybody's I've ever heard. And including mine, and I have some good ones, but David's was this. My brother David, at the top of his fame in 1971, 72, sat in his living room on a New Year's Eve night with a bottle of bourbon and John Lennon and two guitars, and they sang all the Beatles songs, and David sang all the Paul McCartney parts. Oh my God. He wins. I, I mean, he wins. Can that be, I don't know if that could be beat, you know? No, I mean, so, that's amazing. But, but for you, what as Debbie Gibson did you get to do in your life with who or, or, or the thing you did? What would you say was like one of those highlight moments that you got to do as a result of being Debbie Gibson? Well, it's very, it's funny because when you were talking about that, it popped into my head and it's a very similar thing because it involves being a fan. Like I am the hugest Elton John fan and Billy Joel fan because I was this little girl playing the piano and I was like, I was playing Billy's and your rag and all this stuff. <laughs> I went to see Elton John at the garden and um, I went backstage and he asked if, and Billy was there and I had met Billy before. And um, he said, uh, you know, Debbie, Bill, Billy and I are doing a duet at the end of the show. We're doing Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Would you like to join us? And I was like, <laughs> I was 18. I was like, uh, yeah. You know, he told me what key they were going to do it in. And he said, but, you know, I have a keyboard for Billy, but I don't have one for you. So do you mind sharing mine with me? I was like, oh. so I'm looking at, you know, it's like looking at the keys, like, you know, there's my, there's my, my hands and hands. And I was playing the song by ear, and he just and afterwards he goes, "Oh wow, you played really well." But right, I just butchered it just then because I wasn't thinking about doing it. But he was like, "Wow, you played really well by ear." I didn't know you could play by ear. I was like, "Oh my god, it was so surreal." Oh my gosh! And then, like you'll see on my Instagram, Billy sent me a, a message for my fiftieth birthday recently. And as you know, like if I don't know, like I don't know who you're a fan of, and I want to hear that in a second because like. When you're a little kid and you're a, a, a fan of a, a certain artist, it just never goes away. The never. thrill never goes away. Never. So I was like, oh, my God, when I got this message from Billy Joel for my birthday. No, those those two were right there. I have, I'm have i a fan of both of them. I saw the, the Piano Man concert where they played together. I saw, but you're too young for this, I saw Elton at Dodger Stadium. And when oh, I was 14, wow. I, I I literally took the bus with my friends. He mm -hmm. came out in a blue Dodger sequined Dodger outfit. Yep, and yep, I know. Yeah, yeah, yes. It says, "Oh, I have a question for Debbie. Uh, Debbie, I'm moving to uh, is it Phoenix oh, with my that's father?" Question. Yeah, yeah. my family. Uh, when close. I moved to New York, it was it. How different did it feel? So when I first moved from New York, I went to L.A. and L.A. is such a strange place. Like. I know it now and I love it now, but when you first get to LA and you're a New Yorker, I, I felt very out of, I felt very disoriented, but that's LA. I mean, I know Phoenix, I don't know, you know, I've been there, but honestly, I love going back to the East Coast. You always have to be careful how you answer these questions because my East Coast people are gonna be like, you don't love, <laughs> I love a good New York visit if I can like, do equal time. But I have really grown accustomed to the sun. I mean, I just am like a weather fanatic now. I just, there's something so life -affirming. And again, I love the seasons. Like, I love going back for Christmas. Um, oh, my God. Someone said I love the acoustic guitar. So I'm the worst guitarist ever. That is my childhood guitar from when I was like eight years old, and I played it in church. I'm oh. terrible. You won't be hearing. I gave it a try, but it just never quite stuck. But going back to the question about moving, 
I don't know. I think change is good. I think change is fun. Um, you know, you've done the East Coast, so go for it. I think enjoy it. I I know that people always say like old friends are the best. You know what I've learned? Old friends are great and new friends are great. Sure. I am friends with my, I have all my neighbors on speed dial. I love my people. Nobody's in show business around me. It's all like normal people. Mm -hmm. And I love it. So what I think- is your, What is your favorite musical of all time? Oh my gosh, Cliffy D. So Cliffy's uh, one of my big deadheads supporters from Australia. Um, God, that's always a crazy question for me. I mean, Gypsy and Cabaret are neck and neck for me. Yep. And doing both of them, I mean, like mind boggling. Wait here, I'm giving, I'm giving you a little tour. There's the Gypsy, the Betty Buckley Gypsy poster. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, yep. you did that at Paper Mill too, didn't you? That at Paper Mill. Yep, with uh, Laura Bell Bundy, who I've, oh. I've been binge watching Heart of Dixie. I missed it the first time. Oh. So, Laura and I were, if mama were married, we'd live in a house as private as private can be. Just mama, three ducks, nine canaries, and best two monkeys, one father, six turtles, and me. I'm always listing things as a mom. I love that song. I love that show. And then Cabaret doing that Sam Mendes, Rob Marshall. Oh, or, yeah. With Neil Patrick Harris. Oh, yeah. Amazing. And for those of you theater kids watching it, they're, like I say, kids, but people who are like auditioning and stuff, um, I knew that no one was ever going to see me as a Sally Bowles because I was like this very innocent, you know, I played Belle and all that. And so I went and auditioned for another random roundabout show that I had no real interest in doing or business doing um, because I knew if I got in the room with the right people, they'd go, oh, she's got the grit to play Sally. And I know that that's an in-person vibe with me. So like, even when you are, you could be a household name, it doesn't matter, you are always auditioning totally. and you gotta get resourceful and creative about it because you can't expect people are, I always go, no one's waking up going like, what role can I offer Debbie Gibson today? Nobody's doing that. No, I mean, I mean, Deb, I had the same thing with playing Julian Marsh in 42nd Street. They didn't think I had, an, they said they'd see me as Joseph, you know? Right. I, and, and also they saw me, they see you as that youthful thing that you can't play a man that's 40 years older. Right. And the truth is I was more that than I was Joseph. Right, right. And your last name, that family name, much like my last name, probably, you know, played against you at times. Oh, and sure. you had to prove it. It's always fun though when you prove it. <laughs> well, tell me about, tell me about, uh, <laughs> So at what point in your adulthood did you decide, did, did Playboy come to you and say, hmm, I think you'd make a great, some sort of, not a centerfold, but a some sort of pictorial thing. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, they start, first of all, Playboy starts coming to you the minute you turn 18. Yeah. So they came to me at like 18, at 21, at 24, like literally, like she ready yet? Is she ready yet? And it was when I was doing Gypsy because I was doing that striptease and I was in touch with that part of my femininity and sexuality. And it suddenly didn't feel gimmicky to do it. It suddenly didn't feel, it suddenly felt authentic. It felt like, well, this is actually weirdly in keeping with something I'm doing now. And maybe they'll let me do it in kind of like a burlesque stylized right. way, which they did. They go, we don't care. We just want her to, you know, we want her in the magazine. I was like, you know what? This is so iconic. It felt, you know, I was 34. So I wasn't like, Debbie Gibson's proving she's a woman. I'd been a woman for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like, God, this is one of those once in a lifetime things that I don't think I'll ever regret, but I regret saying no to it. And when I did it, A, it was super fun and like freeing. And I kind of giggled my way through it. And then we talked about this too. Like I would go to the mansion to have right. got on his dinner and movie night list, which is very tame and lovely and almost like like a big family. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and, and they, it's a beautiful buffet, and they watch a current movie that's playing in the movie house. And I would play the piano, and his his old half soul cronies would be like, Debbie, sing something from Evita. <laughs> <laughs> Don't cry for me, Argentina. The truth is. I kept my promise to keep you on to stand. 
That was one I never did, actually. Good uh, part for you. Good part for you. Am I too old? Does it matter anymore? No, darling. Are you kidding? Have you seen yourself underneath this? this I new look? I can influencer light. I can do it at home with my light on Zoom. I'm playing with to everybody in my living room next Saturday. Yeah, Jen has <laughs> asked a very interesting question. I was going to ask you this too. After the pandemic is over, is there any chance you'd ever do it? I, I have you ever done anything in Las Vegas? Have you ever, ever played? Well, I, can. I know Jen. Um, uh, I well, I, I get I never know how to answer this either. We'll just say yes, that is a very interesting idea that has come up and yeah. might have been actually very, very much uh, in the cards, but then the pandemic obviously changed all those conversations. So the answer is absolutely looking to do that at the right moment. And the good thing I'm yelling, this is a shout out to all the producers. You don't need to pay for housing. She lives there. So I, <laughs> the thing about too, like, you know, I love what I love about Vegas. Oh, I want to um, uh, read that question in a minute too. But, you know, I, I love that, like, you know, you have everyone from like Brittany with all the bells and whistles to like, I saw Garth at the win mm -hmm. and he had nothing but a headset mic and his guitar. And it was spectacular. And when I do my shows and my my audience out there watching me who, who see me live, I like do, coming out, doing the bells and whistles, the dancers, the hits, the arrangements, and then bringing it down to what we're doing right now. Yeah. And like being off the cuff and at the piano, I think that's such a fun vibe. I'd love to bring that to Vegas. Like I'd love to do Vegas in my that, way. I agree. You know, my brother, Sean, uh, right before the pandemic, the summer before he, uh, for the first time in 40 years, because he's been a very successful writer, producer in television, yeah. he didn't perform any of the hits. And he had a number, to do run run was a number one single. Uh, that's rock and roll was a number four. <laughs> I always love that, like changing the, the gender of songs. Although I could say Jill, it's a you know. Oh yeah. Well, it was originally it was originally done by the Shirelles, I believe, and they called they said Bill. Bill. John so said Jill. That's so make that up. Okay. So anyway, he but he did he crafted this act together first time in forty years, and he it's and um and it was all just like that. It's a band. He has a band of like six or seven, but it's stories about his life and songs impromptu, and yeah, it's right? really. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really, really cool. Um, I want to show you something that I think you'll get a kick out of because I know you haven't seen this. Do we okay. have that queued up? Can so I this ask that question really quick that just went off the screen? Yeah, yeah. So somebody asked, like, if I'm because because yesterday I posted a video of myself working on a new song um, in my home studio, which was a uh, This is me and I'm loving you. technology while I'm home recording. So when I was a kid, I was like fascinated by sequencing and doing all my own arrangements. And then as time went on, I realized I can learn all that stuff, but I like being the creative person more than the techie. So I can do enough to do, to get my ideas down. But I sent it, I actually worked with a 19 year old kid in Vancouver who was in my Hallmark movies named Sean Thomas, who tracks things up for me. And he is my musical kindred spirit. I send him a piano vocal and I go, I would love to hear it. Like I give him a reference of how I want it to sound. And he sends something back to me and we tweak it and we work virtually. He can sit in front of that computer all day long and arrange the heck out of my stuff. Um, I want to be the stream of consciousness mad scientist creator now. That's really, because because if I were to, if I were to even try to catch up with Sean, I couldn't even do anything else that I love to do. It would take me years. You right. know, people right. graduate from Berkeley soon online. Um, and that's such its own art form that I'm good now, like not being the girl who has to say, I can do this and I can do that and I can do this. And I'm watching Cisco Pit of I can do that. I can do that. I want to show I want to show you. I want to show you because I think you'll get a kick out of this. So this is from uh, one of uh, my fans and one of our family fans, uh, their archival collection of Cassidy memorabilia. This is from our Joseph. 
the tanning cream look on me, huh? I know, that's <laughs> like, how did I have, have just like in all seriousness, how did you stay that in shape on the road? I ate, I ate, ate tuna, out of, I ate tuna out of a can, literally oh tuna God. out of a can with no mayonnaise and that nothing. So else. funny, I'm moving my life, I'm so vain. And a lot, of, and a lot of tanning cream. It oh was, that God. was an amazing tour. It that was, was amazing. Yeah, if that really brought me back. Oh my gosh. And yeah, and, and 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 we had fun. We had a great time. I mean, like I said, you know, both tours, you know, because because Deb, I did it again in in 05, 06. And that time Cole and Jack were seven and ten. So they were in the kids' chorus. I oh. used to I used to lift Cole on my shoulder at the beginning of the show, and he'd pull down this thing that said, like in the beginning, right, with the narrator and stuff. And I've told this story before, and Jack, who was seven. Uh, during Close Every Door, the big ballad that Joseph sings, Jack be, would be in the kids' chorus, right? And they all be looking at me, and Jack would be picking his nose, literally picking oh his nose. God. And all the focus goes to the kid picking his nose in the chorus. Oh, my God. I'm so much by the nose picker. I love it. <laughs> yes. it, was a great, it was such a great time. Um, you are awesome. I, I want you to also say, because um, tell me about uh, uh, Cameo. You were like, you've done over 1,500 Cameo. Yeah. About when I signed back on any minute, I took like a month off. Cause it's so funny, people go like, and I am, believe me, I'm lucky to be able to be doing something during a pandemic, like work-wise, but that's mm -hmm. fun and I'm home. Um, but it's a lot, it's a specific, it's like doing, it is like doing a concert, a mini concert for each person. So what I do is like, like let's say Melissa ordered you a cameo. Okay, okay. So I'd write a little cue card on my app, on my phone, and I'd be like, I'd be like, Patrick, Debbie Gibson here, Melissa dropped by and let me know that you guys have been married for 48 years? How is that possible? You don't look a day over 45. I mean, it's amazing. Listen, but she wants to dedicate this to you. And I go on and on and send you guys so much love. Anyway, I love, love, love doing Okay, it. Oh, so our producers are our producers are crying right now. <laughs> Literally, where do you order a cameo? But my, my, my producer is going, my producer is going, where do I order a cameo? Immediately. I'm going to back on, probably, I'm going to say in about a week. Uh, cameo, yes, there's the cameo.com. Um, but really, the, the reason I love doing it, so when I do it, like I'm an energy person, mm -hmm. I, I read what someone writes, and sometimes people make a video explaining who they are and who the video is for, which I love because I get a visual, I get like a, a real vibe. And I just feel like, again, I go back to that Billy Joel message that I got. So if I'm that for somebody, I want to I wanna knock their socks off. I want to give them a moment. You know, I want to give them something where, again, during these crazy times when 
we've all picked ourselves up by our bootstraps so many times this year and we're all a little exhausted by it. So if somebody can watch this five minute video I made them and I'm singing just to them, like I, I literally feel tears when I talk about it because I just send them all my positive energy and I want them to have an experience, a moment to know that they're special. I'm a people person, I love people. Mm -hmm. I love when someone goes, this is for my best friend. She's a healthcare worker. She's on the front lines, whatever the thing is. My friend just lost his dog. I mean, I get all kinds of things. I'm sure. but like, I'm a, I'm, like I get to be a part of someone's life moment and maybe help make them feel better. Or well, tell wanna, them. You, you are amazing. And I, I want to close with something that we do on this show. But before I ask you the question, we play, we do a, um, we do another game on this show and it's called you become the host for one question. Okay. But before I, and I'm going to give you, 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 you will become the host for one question. So I'll give you a chance to think about it. But before I tell you this, I want to tell you <laughs> that when I gave this, I give it to everybody. And when I gave it to my friend, treat Williams, he, I hadn't seen treat treat was my pirate King and pirates on Broadway. And it'd been 30 years since I had seen him. And yet I followed his career and he fought, and he thought about it. And I'm saying, I'm going to give you his answer because this is what I, if you would ask me the question and I was your host, I would say this to you. I would say what he said to me. I'd say, Deb, uh, we've lost touch as friends over the years. And it would be my wish if I could have that friendship with you now. That's so lovely. So I'm asking you, that's my question to you. Can I now have the friendship that's been lost for a lot of years? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love our friendship now. I love, the, I love like, I love that, you know, we're grownups now. Again, we're free of all the whatever was in the way. Mm -hmm. And we were always meant to be friends. And I'm so happy we're friends now. Me too. All right. So you get one question. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh my gosh! But like it could be like a question about anything. Anything. Just about anything at all. Well, since we were talking about, you know, love and marriage, I know it's a cliche question, but I really want to know, and I kind of know because I've been around you guys. You and Melissa have been together for how long? We've been together 27 years. We'll be, we'll be, we've, we've been together 27 years. We'll be married 27 years in February, but I know her 32. Wow. Mm -hmm. And again, like, look, my longest relationship, 10 years. Mm -hmm. How have you kept it going all these years? What is it about Melissa that made her the one? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, we, uh, we don't have another hour and a half, but I will say this. Um, it's a, we constantly work at it. You change. You really change. I, I am not the same person that, that I was when, when we got married. She is not the same person. Uh, and, and we loved each other then. And we went through, you go through highs and lows. You go through hills and valleys. You go through really difficult times. But you, may, you take that vow, for better or for worse. You take that vow. And if you really listen to those vows, and they, the, to me, they become much deeper as you get older. You really hear the words. Mm -hmm. But they mean so much more later if you're willing to, to really listen to them and put them into motion on a day-to-day -day basis because there's a lot of things that you go through. and that. But for me, and I think she might say this too, is that at the end of the day, you start to look at each other and you go, I... I love the time I put in with this person. I love the time that I got to spend looking at this person, going through the highs and lows with this person, and then ultimately just loving that person. And um, that's awesome. So, yeah. So yeah, that's it's a great question. And thank you. Nobody, nobody's ever asked me that. So thank you. Really? Hmm. No. Oh my gosh! Wow. No, you guys always like had a very solid bond. Mm -hmm. And I mean, God, you know, this goes back 20 years Then you were, so I guess you were pretty new that I thought, I didn't think of it that way. You were only together at that point for seven years. That's yeah. five, eight yeah. years. Um, be a solid bond. And you always like also looked like you keep things spicy. Yeah, we do. No, we, you, have have to be of, you have to be inventive. <laughs> you both have very vital, vibrant energy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's a good thing too. kind of, you know, 
I would imagine though, over the years, you kind of want to keep that, but you also want to relax. You want like, you want to be able to also just like relax and let down in your home and not always be like, Hey, what can I do to keep no, things? I'm, no. I, I'm after this interview, I'm going home. She's making me Chinese food and we're watching nurse ratchet. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's our plan for the evening. Uh, well, thank you so much, Patrick and Deb. Thank you so much for watching dream. Uh, Deb, you are fantastic. I, I adore you and I can't thank you enough. You are so, you're so good. And our producers are going to be looking you up on cameo. <laughs> How much do you yeah, charge? I love it. What was that? What do you charge on cameo? I charge one ninety five. My price has been the same for a long time. There are people on there that charge five. I've had people go, you should make it higher. I, I felt like that was a number that, uh, lower, I can't keep up with the requests. Like literally can't keep up. Right. Uh, higher feels just like, especially during these times, way too much. Because what I feel like is like with this number, you know, especially if like you've got a group of people saying, let's all chip in and get someone a gift. Mm -hmm. you know, people chip in $25 each and they get the thing. And, you know, and again, it's like, and it's so funny because um, sometimes like we do cameos for charities and things like that. But I always, like my audience knows, my life is one big charity. Like before I've rolled out of bed, I've usually funded some animal going to a rescue or mm -hmm. donated someone. Um, and again, like everybody, I, I need people's support too from the outside to continue to help doing that. I just think it's all kind of a big, like loving circle, especially right now. Yeah. Everybody like lifting everyone helping everyone well that's what that's what we do that's what that's what that's what you're doing by doing our show thank you so much again uh for those of you uh who know uh please donate to studio tennis the reason why we're here it's the reason we got debbie to come here and we will continue this next week we have mr michael feinstein on the show oh, uh, cool. he's another piano playing guy uh he'll, he'll be on he'll be on so right Below is where you can donate. You can call that number. There's Michael right there. He is on next Monday. And Deb, uh, usually I close the show by doing just a tiny piece, a cappella, of some goodbye song. I've done so long, farewell, avidos, and good night. I've done them all. I've done them all. So I thought what would be appropriate since you have the piano it's just, is to just do a little piece of your song, Goodbye. Is that what it's called? Yes, that's what it's called. I, I co wrote it with Carol Bayer Sager. Oh wow! Leonardo Michael Walden, who wrote many a great Whitney hit and, and other other songs, but yes, so it's been lovely hanging out with you, Patrick, and everybody watching. Goodbye. Good night, everybody. Love you, Deb. Love you, Patrick. Bye, Cree. Bye. <laughs>